Hello and welcome back to Searching for Reality. Here we are in Module 9, still in the classroom and still searching. And this week we're going to take a look at David Hume and Immanuel Kant. And those two individuals are these characters right here. This is David Hume and Immanuel Kant. And essentially, uh, Kant's response to Hume makes up a, a large uh, section of his book, Critique of Pure Reason. And so it's not as if he is criticizing Hume completely. In instead, what happens with Kant is Hume wakes up some idea in, in Kant's sort of dormant part of his brain uh, about some of the assumptions that we have made about reality, and more importantly, about how we perceive and acknowledge and gain knowledge from reality. So that's essentially what we're going to look at today. So we've got these two thinkers uh, that overlap to a fair degree. Of course, Kant being born uh, slightly later, uh, a couple of decades or uh, roughly a decade later. Uh, but Hume belongs to a field of philosophy called British empiricism. And British empiricists, or empiricists in general, again, as we've mentioned num numerous times, those are the individuals that study the world as we learn from it, learn about it from sense data right from our senses so an empiricist is someone that uh, lays claim to knowledge in terms of what we can perceive with our eyes and ears and so on what we hear what we see what we can touch what we can know but what we can know is only something through our through our sense data and this is kind of the, the field that Hume belongs to and is part of but he's a very interesting character because he is also a skeptic and skeptics uh, question, right? Question authority, question assumptions. And this is where we find the link between Hume and Kant. It's the way in which Hume sort of uh, is skeptical about certain claims that we make about understanding and knowing the world that wakes up Kant and uh, wakes him up by way of a response because Kant believes that what is, uh, what is important here is not losing either the empirical tradition or the rationalist tradition. So let's not get too, ahead of our, uh, too far ahead of ourselves here and then just come back and take a look. So we have Hume, who is an empiricist, and then we've got Immanuel Kant, who uh, is considered to be an idealist. But in the same way that Hume is a sort of questioning uh, empiricist, Kant is also a questionist idealist. So keep that in mind because these two people, these two philosophers fit in their respective categories, but adopt a rather questioning stance in terms, in terms of what can be known. So this is really what makes them interesting. And one thing that's important with Hume is that he was for sure an empiricist, but he had a very common sense and realistic approach to knowledge and the experiences that we have through our senses of the outside world. But as, as I mentioned, he's also a skeptic in the sense that he likes to kind of do away with all the all the sort of hyperbole and and massive theoretical edifices that are built around theories, so that perhaps the 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 best idea is maybe the simplest one. So Hume is very much uh, sort of traveling down that road. He's he's wishing for a, a common sense approach to understanding the world around us. So he proceeds carefully, cautiously. Uh, always with a level of doubt, uh, and certainly not to the degree that he is going to knock down science. He still wishes for science to prove certain things, but also reserves the right to, to hold back judgment. And Hume, like Francis Bacon that we spoke about last week or uh, two weeks ago now, uh, as much as he is looking to understand the world uh, from a scientific perspective, he is, in fact, even more skeptical than a scientist. He wants to make absolutely sure that we proceed with caution, proceed with an open mind, proceed with at least some degree of doubt. You know, are we sure that we're sure? And of course, this extends to his, to his ideas of, uh, of religion, which is still very much on the table and very much discussed in the marketplace of ideas. But in this particular case, Hume is saying, you know, this is kind of really odd that we're really going out of our way and bending over backwards to prove the existence of something we we cannot even qualify. We just have this idea of religion. We have this idea of a, a godhead. Uh, and so because, because Hume is a skeptic, 
The furthest he's willing to go is to be at least not an atheist, but an agnostic. And someone who is agnostic reserves the right to change their mind at a later date if conclusive proof can be presented as evidence that a particular thing is, is occurring. In this case, of course, as an agnostic, that, that God exists, that there is existence of God uh, in the world. And until that happens, Hume is not willing to say absolutely no, because remember, he's proceeding with caution, right? And he's proceeding carefully and with an open mind. So that open mind states for him that there is the possibility that God may exist, but we don't have the traditional proofs that we have to say that that is in fact the case. So his writings, of course, people who have attacked him, calling him an atheist, and he said, no, no, I'm an agnostic. So an atheist is someone who does not believe at all, 100%. Nothing exists beyond this. Hume says, well, hold on. I can't now sort of switch gears on just this particular topic and yet remind, or remain, you know, cautious and careful with everything else. It's right across the board. So Hume does believe that religion still plays an important part in the development of societies. Uh, his writings on uh, natural religions, for example, is very um, open-minded and, and objective. But he does say that, you know, societies have needed religions and have needed gods in the past. But what we cannot agree on is what this thing is. Are, is there one? Are there many? Is, is it pantheism, polytheism, monotheism? What are the qualities and quantities uh, of a godhead? All those, all those things that are part of the experience of religion. Hume says, you know, we're really having a tough time proving any of these things. So we need to be careful as we move forward into conclusions about the existence of a God or really anything else. So when Hume is talking about experience versus knowledge, he sounds a lot like John Locke in the sense that he does make that distinction between an idea and the sense impression that generates that idea. Because much like Locke, he looks at the external world as being a series of complex ideas that we have we've constructed about about that world. Uh, but they are ideas about the world. And keep that in mind as we now as we talk later about Kant. So Hume distinguishes ideas from sense impressions. And the sense impressions generate and become the foundation for ideas. And that is true because for Hume, all ideas are in some way grounded with sense impression. And this is why he is reluctant to embrace the notion of the existence of God, because we don't have sense impressions of God. We can look at natural laws. We can look at the beauty of nature. But Hume says, OK, but that could just be the natural order of something. And if there is a natural order of beauty, uh, if that's the case, why is it that when we leave things alone and we let nature take its course, that it literally runs rampant? Um, if you've never mowed your back lawn for, say, three or four months in the middle of the summer, it's not orderly and beautiful. It isn't. It's it's a mess. There's weeds everywhere. It's just it's crazy. So Hume reserves judgment on many things because of the fact that, yes, on the one hand, he says that knowledge is generated from sense impressions, but we need to be careful how we create those ideas from those sense impressions. Because he does say, yes, the mind combines elements of impressions to create things that don't exist, which is why we can think about uh, fantasy uh, literature. We can imagine people living on other planets uh, because we can imagine them. We know they don't exist, but we're basing it on uh, the, the ability for us to imagine something that could exist on another planet or that you know horses could have uh, horns and be called unicorns. But we also know that they, they are false ideas. They're simply combinations of things that we know exist in the world, but combined in, in an unusual way, in a, in a fictional kind of way. So yes, there are, there are some similarities between Locke and Hume, uh, but Hume, again, is skeptical. He is uh, certainly more than willing to remind us that we can suspend our, our disbelief sometimes. We can sort of fall into superstition uh, because this is a kind of the, uh, the way that the world is being looked at at that point. Religion was still very powerful. Don't, don't get me wrong here. It is, which is why making these kinds of statements uh, was almost sacrilegious. Now, the reason why David Hume is still around and we know about him today is because in England, the church had a different 
approach to uh, philosophical ideas, they took more of a hands-off approach. They may not have agreed, but they took more of a hands-off approach than, the, than they did in, in France, where the Enlightenment thinkers, uh, some of them were, were very much fearful of losing their lives for just in, expressing ideas. So here Hume is basically allowed to speak his mind and to discuss things with a degree of skepticism and doubt that was not always available to other people, to other thinkers. So he says, our simple ideas uh, in their first appearances are derived from simple impressions, which are co which correspond to them and which they exactly represent. So when, there's something interesting going on here. So let's read this again. All our simple ideas in their first appearance are derived from simple impressions, sense data which are which are correspondent to them and which they exactly represent so what's happening is we are moving from reality itself to representations where we are re we are representing reality to ourselves in our minds so what the mind does is represent reality to us along logical and rational lines that make sense and when they don't make sense, we either know we are reading or experiencing fiction, or there's something going wrong. We're, we're in the middle of the movie Inception, where you know roads are curving backwards and suddenly the horizon is vertical rather than horizontal. We know this doesn't normally happen. We, we're hoping it never does, but we know that typically this should not happen because our mind represents reality, the outside world, reality to us in such a way that at least matches up with the sense impressions that are not only uh, based on sense data, but also are rational and reasonable. So what our mind does is it represents the world to us using a series of sort of computations and computations like cause and effect uh, and proportion and size and shape and so on. Those things allow us to take simple sense data and create complex ideas. That's essentially what our mind is doing. So Hume claims that Descartes' cogito doesn't show that there is a self because we don't perceive the self. Remember that uh, the mind for Descartes supersedes, right? It is more powerful than the body. And so this, this mind uh, that is able to understand and know the world, even by itself without sense data, because it is rational, it is able to devise the world purely through reason, no matter what, uh, Hume says, okay, we, when we are thinking, we're always thinking of something. We're thinking about something. There is, it's not possible to just have consciousness because if you've ever tried to get back to sleep at night when you wake up at 2.30 in the morning, why did you wake up? Because your mind is racing. But think about it. You're laying in bed in the dark. You are, you are not experiencing any other sense data than what's in your mind. So sense data is now really important because you can't see or hear really anything, but your mind is racing with ideas. But typically, that's that's unusual, but typically consciousness is always of something. So there's no consciousness of consciousness. I'm not self-aware all the time. I'm thinking about things and I have to stop and think about it, but that's all I'm doing. I'm merely thinking. I'm not reminding myself, oh, I am a living thing. I'm only thinking about the fact that I am thinking about something. So Hume is kind of sort of going after Descartes in the sense that, you know, we don't per perceive the self through our mind. We simply perceive other ideas. And so nothing but a bundle or collections of different perceptions. Yep, that's me at 2.30 in the morning, right? Which succeed each other with inconceivable rapidity and are a perpetual flux and movement. Yeah, that's us not able to get, uh, not being able to get to sleep at 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning. So it's just, a series of images, right? And the mind is constantly active, but at no point is it ever active in thinking about itself as, as a conscious being, right? It just, it just doesn't happen. Now, as we move further into Hume's ideas, here's where it starts getting, uh, not more complicated, but you kind of want to just go, oh, face palm. Here he, here he goes. So Hume is, as a skeptic, able to pinpoint some of the the moments where we are making assumptions about what we we think we see and Hume's um, sort of tool for this is that skeptical attitude 
And one of the most important ones that he sort of brings forth to us is the notion of causation. And causation is important because, as he says here, it is only causation which, which produces such a connection as to give us assurance from the existence or action of one object that was followed or preceded by any other existence or action. So we have, let's say, two objects. And we, let's say, uh, two billiard balls on a pool table. And we gently push the one, and it rolls, and it hits the other one. The first one stops. The other one continues. Wow. Yeah, cause and effect. There it is. But for Hume, <laughs> not so fast, right? For Hume, causation is not a substance or fundamental principle. So for Hume, causation is just a logical construct. It's something that we derive from viewing something. If we see the billiard ball hit the other one and the second one continues and the first one stops or it may move a little bit, we look at it and say, well, there it is. It's cause and effect. But Hume says, well, the causation, we cannot see. We can see the one billiard ball and we can see the other one, but the, that the action, the, the transmission of kinetic energy, we'll say, from the one ball to the other is simply an assumption. We simply assume this will happen. So for Hume, causation is not a substance. It's not a thing, right? It's a response. It's a uh, result. Uh, it is something that occurs after the fact. It's uh, a posteriori rather than a priori. So all these things Hume looks at is, okay, are these really existing in the world? Or are these just logical constructs that we have put into our minds in order to at least understand how the world operates? So knowledge of causation is grounded in experience, right? Or sense impression. So if that's, if that's true, do we actually see the causation? We see movement and the stopping of movement, the continuation of another kind of movement, but causation itself is not a thing we can hold on to or measure or grasp. So this, this makes uh, the way in which Hume sees the world, I mean, a high degree of skepticism. And of course, we look at it and say, well, of course it's there. But if we stop and we are honest with ourselves, it's true. It's true. We, we don't, we don't see it. So it is, uh, quite, quite important. In fact, it's in, uh, this book right here. Uh, this is Essays and Treatises on Philosophical Subjects by David Hume. And he talks about, uh, skeptical doubt concerning the operation of the understanding. So we look at something, we understand why the one ball stopped moving and the other began to move, right? We think it's causation. We call it causation. We agree that is called causation. Because otherwise, if there's no agreement, uh, different people call it different things. So he writes in part one, all the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into, into two kinds, relations of ideas and matters of fact. Of the first kind are the sciences of geometry, algebra, and arithmetic. And in short, every affirmation, which is either intuitively or demonstratively certain that the square of a hypotenuse is equal to the squares of the two sides is a proposition which expresses the relationship between these figures. Uh, three times five is equal to half of 30 expresses the relationship between these numbers. Propositions of this kind are discoverable by the mere operation of thought without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe. And so he begins to talk about causation in the same way that we we're making, <laughs> we're making assumptions is what's happening. And we shouldn't because as the old cliche goes, you know, never assume because it makes an ass out of you and me. And it's stupid and true, but there it is. So Hume is the person, the, the skeptical philosopher that points this out to us that we, we see things or we think we see things, but we, these are not measurable. These are not actual substances in the world. They are responses. They are things that we assume are going to happen. But that's all we can do. We simply assume they're, they're, these things are going to happen. So we, we don't experience causation, but we do experience the connection between two things, right? We see the constant connection between the cause and effect and assume there is some mysterious thing that we call cause, call, so say causation. So we look at the world and we wonder what is, what is going on. I mean, why that one object stopped moving? or maybe continue a little bit more, the other one is moving. Any kind of cause and effect relationship, causation, 
can only be assumed to be happening because causation itself is not something that we see. Uh, this is another short passage just from a book by Philip Blom, A Wicked Company. This is an excellent book on the radical French Enlightenment. And here, Blom is, is writing about Hume. Now, why is he writing about Hume on a book about French philosophers? Because David Hume and Baron Dolbach and Helvetius and other radical French and Enlightenment thinkers were actually all good friends. Uh, the French spoke enough English to be able to speak to Hume and vice versa. And so in the, in the book, we're going to talk about uh, the same sort of thing, right? Hume's point, uh, uh, Hume's point appears to be little more than a thought experiment for if you actually believe that the sun might not rise tomorrow and then its power begins to unfold, right? Because we assume the sun is going to rise again tomorrow. The intention is not to argue that we may one day wake up in total darkness, but to take the iron away, the iron certainty of logic out of the ideas formed from experience. So this is kind of the nugget with Hume is now we look at logic and we realize, OK, we're relying an awful lot on logical constructs to understand the world. Those exist in our mind. They don't exist in the real world. They are the ways in which our mind is able to make sense of the world. So again, uh, to take the iron certainty of logic out of the ideas formed from experience. Once this point has been conceded, entire worlds come crashing down. Or in the case of inception, they get twisted all over the place. If there is no logical force to the connection between idea, if habit alone, habit and assumption, alone governs our conception of the world, then we will never be certain of anything. Instead of knowing, we will simply have to assume that the sun will always move and and circulate around the sun, or sorry, <laughs> we will circulate around the sun, uh, my mistake, and all the things that we accept as, as assumptions are going to continue. Therefore, if there is no a priori knowledge, no certainty in part from that which we, we can deduce from observation, from our senses, and if the stream of impressions and memories is all we can know, then there, there is actually no such thing as a self at all, just a constant background noise of perceptions and interconnecting ideas that appear to be coherent, constant, and yet are based on assumptions. So that is, that is what um, David Hume is asking us to consider, that things that we think we see in the world really are not happening because we're, our mind is representing to us the world as we see it. Now, imagine if causation was something that we didn't understand and it took us a while to understand causation, but to understand causation. It doesn't mean we, we see it, we measure it, we identify it, we can paint it a different color. You know, uh, we just made an assumption and it's based on consistency, right? The assumption that the sun will rise again tomorrow, the assumption that if I drop something this far up from the ground, it'll fall straight down um, if, at the relatively the same rate. All those things are ultimately assumptions. They're not part of the sense the sense of uh, the sensual world of reality, but they are representations of the world to us that, of course, at the end of the day, help us to make sense of the world, because without it, uh, we would have an awful, you know, awful lot of trouble just making sense of the world on a, you know, on any given day. So uh, Hume argues that the theory of causation explaining connections must be gained from induction. That is the hypothesis, right? The likelihood of causation confirmed by the constant connection of events. So we need to simply make an assumption that this is the way things are. But remember, if you're making an assumption, you're also leaving open the possibility of something else happening, something different happening. So induction cannot be justified without assuming induction. So uh, really all of these sort of logical constructs are just that. They're logical constructs rather than actual physical things that we can see and measure in the world. We look at the world and it, we see it sort of in a, in a consistent sort of way. But at the same time, we always want to make sure that we understand that the same thing will continue to occur in an, an hour from now, a year from now. So throughout our entire life, we make assumptions constantly about the world. And we get through it just fine because those assumptions help us to 
well, to stay calm, <laughs> to not stress over the fact that, hey, is uh, the sun going to come up tomorrow? Well, I don't know. I can't see it because, you know, the pollution is so thick. So as we are thinking about the world and we are making assumptions or inductions or inductive reasoning, right, we uh, were able to see, okay, well, if I see a swan that is white uh, and all the swans I've seen throughout my life are white, I'm going to assume that all swans are white. So it is it is circular for Hume in the sense that we have to assume that induction, in fact, is occurring and not in order for us to to make even a simple claim like all swans are white. So an inductive argument concludes that the future will be like the past. Uh, future connections will be similar to past observed ones. Uh, I have seen nothing but white swans in the past. In the future, I assume I will see more white swans. There might be a black one somewhere. I don't know. Maybe it's blue. Maybe it's plaid. I don't know. But you're making assumptions from what you have seen in the past and making a prediction about the future. And that's inductive reasoning. If this is so, I assume that it will remain so unless I see something that is clearly the opposite, at which point I need to rethink, you know, my inductive form of reasoning. So this is the, the kind of thinking that Hume, again, uh, is is going to great pains to point out that the mental the mental work that goes into understanding reality is maybe uh, something we haven't considered as much, right? We haven't been as uh, self-aware of the things that we do for us to make sense of the world. This is, I think, why Hume is, is talking about there's no self at all, right? It's just simply uh, just fleeting information. It's almost like we are, we're standing in the world that's just literally flying by us. Uh, I wouldn't want to live like that. I would like to be able to have some degree of selfhood that is based on assumptions and, and the belief in certain logical constructs that help me to make sense of the world. And this is what Hume is, is asking us to do, right? Is to realize that some of those assumptions are in fact very difficult to prove. So let's say we were going to take a look here and, uh, and go, okay, well, if in the past things looked a certain way, then the past needs to, the, sorry, the future needs to resemble the past. And so in the future, let's say tomorrow or even an hour from now, that moment should like, should look like the present. So what's happening here is our knowledge from experience is based on the principles of cause and effect, or so we think, right? We agree to it. We believe in it. We think this is what's happening. The principle of cause and effect is grounded in induction. So cause and effect is based on what we have experienced in the past, what we are, are experiencing presently, and what we are likely to experience in the future. So the motion, moment of induction, right? This, if this is so, then this should be, this should be consistent in the future. So it's still ground in, uh, grounded in induction. So induction relies on a uniformity principle that the future will resemble the past. So the consistency that we install in our minds about the reality of the world, a lot of it is mental constructs. And this is Hume's gift to us to make us realize that, yeah, it's based on an awful lot of assumptions. And of course, the world changes all the time, but we do make assumptions that are enough for us to uh, maybe lie to ourselves or trick ourselves into believing that there are consistent laws that are operating within reality in the natural world for us to understand. Because imagine if the world changed all the time. It, it, we, would, <laughs> we would be stressed out to, to no one's business. So we come to know that uniformity principle from experience because we see it uh, we see it over and over again. We see how it is, in fact, working for us. It's not counterintuitive, not counterproductive, but those assumptions that we make about the world based on past experiences, we are assuming the same will occur in the future. And that cause and effect relationship, which is a kind of induction, um, is still an assumption we make. It's not there, in a sense, in the real world. We're simply thinking of it and believing that that's, in fact, the way the world is. So uh, Hume also was the first person that argued that you can't derive an ought from an is, which means that uh, facts by themselves uh, have no kind of normative or prescriptive truth. Normative have, having to do with expectation. That's what normative behavior is. And he says, no, morality and facts are two different things. And if that is the case, 
He says, even morality, we think it's based on reason. But if we really, again, Hume the, the skeptic, if you really think about it carefully, no, it's more than that. It's it's really sentiment. It's it's the way we would like to feel about ourselves. We would like to think about the fact that we're doing well, right? We understand the world. We know that we should, we, we ought to do something. And there's that ought. But he says, no, just because we ought to do something, we can't conclu conclusively uh, derive that from simply an is. This is the way the world is. But if that is the case, if you're going to make a moral argument, make it from that moral perspective. Because for Hume, um, a moral conclusion needs to be based on that. And re really, what is morality? What is the basis of morality? Well, it's, um, you know, uh, it's it's based in emotion. It's based in, based in sentiment. It's the way you wish other people could live. Is that is that reasonable or rational? Is that does that use logic? No, it's it's a sentiment. I'd like people to behave. I'd like people to be good. So again, think of this when we look at Kant in a few moments, because Kant does have a very consistent response to to Hume in terms of his uh, his thinking of uh, the way that Immanuel Kant uh, uses logic and reason to build uh, his moral system. But Hume says, really, morality is about sentiment and emotion, uh, not not reason, uh, at least the reason, the way in which we are thinking of reason in the present day. So let's uh, let's take a brief, uh, not a brief look, let's take a look at Kant's answer and see exactly what he says. Now, as you probably have noticed in the course, uh, many philosophers are often uh, they live in that sort of continuum of the history of consciousness uh, as individuals that try to reconcile sort of different perspectives. Uh, Plato is one, for example, because he was looking at the, the confusion brought on by the pre-Socratic thinkers. Some were purely empirical, some were purely rational. You've got Parmenides talking about the world as a as a kind of globe with equal pressures and justice and all these sort of, you know, ideas about the world. Heraclitus saying, that you know, the world is in constant motion. Uh, you have a range of ideas. And Plato comes along and tries to sort of reconcile both by saying, well, yes, the world changes all the time. But, and Parmenides is correct. So Heraclitus is correct by saying that the, 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 the reality that we know, that, that is tangible for us, is constantly coming into being and passing away. But behind it is something more consistent, right? This is the world of ideas and forms. So that's how Plato is able to reconcile these two, so these two forces that are moving through pre-Socratic thought. Kant does essentially the same thing, because we have these two, uh, these two forces at work in the history of philosophy: rationalism and empiricism. And rationalism sort of t kind of comes to a to a head, or sort of comes to an impasse with uh, Spinoza, talking about sort of pantheism and the notion of natural laws being the result of a of not even a godhead but a spiritual force that is not you know the old man sitting in clouds anymore which of course greatly upset people who were of religious belief um, but he was a rationalist he was trying to say well if we apply these ideas uh, and we talk about substances we have to talk about a world that is self-created and a god who is self-created who is nature and nature is god so there's rationalism sort of almost at a dead end. And empiricism also kind of hits a different dead end with, with Hume because of his skepticism. We start saying, okay, well, the world is known to us through, through sense data, and we experience the world, and from simple sense data, we begin to form simple ideas, and from that to complex ideas, from complex ideas, you know, to a greater understanding of the world. And along comes Hume and says, you know, most of that is just logical constructs. They're just mental representations. So we have we have these two sort of dead ends, right? One that sort of uh, takes idealism as far or rationalism as far as it can to the point where we belong and we are part of this great spiritual mind that creates both us itself and nature. And there is no division. And that's rationalism sort of at, at one kind of dead end and in empiricism suffering from a high degree of skepticism because Hume's arguments are, are compelling. Because when you stop and think about it, you go, yeah, yeah, cause and effect and induction and causation are kind of mental constructs. They don't exist in the world. So 
Hume uh, begins thinking very seriously about about these issues and tries to achieve a kind of compromise between these two positions to see if there's something that can be reconciled with with both of them and that is very important so the first thing that Kant does is he looks to see what Hume is saying and the first thing that he wants to challenge is this notion of causality and of course Hume said there's no necessary connection between cause cause and, uh, and events or cause and effect uh, we don't observe causality we simply observe a regular connection that we assume is going to happen so that's one the second issue too uh, that is raised by Hume and also addressed by Kant um, is the fact that all moral argu arguments uh, must rely on a moral premise and we need to think about morality as not simply sort of sentiment and emotion but should be based on something more consistent so for Kant Morality needs to be based on a very solid foundation that is reasonable, that is based on duties. And that challenge that Hume presents to future philosophers, uh, Kant essentially takes up the, the challenge and tries to see whether he can, he can reconcile it. So what does he do? He does like Kant. Uh, sorry, he does like Plato. He takes these two movements and brings them together. This is a, a reason why Kant is, is, although considered an idealist, a really interesting idealist because he renders idealist thought, pure idealism and rationalism, he renders it rather problematic. But he also does the same thing uh, with empiricism, much in the same way as, as Hume had, by still being skeptical. Uh, the book that he wrote here, uh, Immanuel Kant, you can't see it, but it's a big thick book, about 600 pages, and it is called Critique of Pure Reason. So. Uh, much like Hume would talk about the natural world and being skeptical of it, Kant was also skeptical, uh, skeptical of pure anything, pure science, pure ideas, because they can become detached from the real world very, very quickly. And our reason has a capacity to kind of flatten out, you know, contradictions and problems so that the idea looks sound, but it's only a mental construct. It's not a representation of the world. So all these issues Kant is having to deal with and so his solution is to try to combine the best elements of rationalism and empiricism to create a sort of a stable foundation for epistemology which is the study of knowledge and metaphysics which is the the or the study of second order realities when we talk about laws of nature and we talk about uh, categories and we talk about sort of uh, universals these are all sort of metaphysical topics so for Kant, all our knowledge of the world comes from our senses, yes, but our reason also determines how these perceptions are going to operate. So that's how he combines these two fields. And again, rather elegant and almost, almost simple. So Kant is the one who says that, yes, I agree, empiricists are correct. We gather and we, we garner knowledge about the, about the world through our senses. That's the one step. The second step, though, is when our minds sort of step in and constructs these perceptions and understand how they operate. So the mind is actively part of that perception. So when we talk about sense data, right, sense impressions, the mind is also actively working there. They're not separate. So who does that sound like? That's Descartes, right, dividing the mind and the body. Kant says no. The mind may be, may be uh, not the body, you know, one may be spiritual, the other is matter, but they definitely interact. And they interact every single time the senses are triggered by something, a sight, a sound, a smell, a touch. The mind kicks in right away, right? But reason, reason that it inhabits in our mind are the, uh, is the thing that helps us to determine what these perceptions are and how they operate. So the mind actively contributes to structuring our perceptions. So we necessarily perceive the world as causal, geometric, orderly, and moral. And in the book here, again, in this big fat 600 page book, uh, there's a table of categories that are of quantity, quality, relation, modality. And within those are three subcategories uh, of quantity, unity, plurality, to totality, of relation, uh, relations of things in the world, uh, of inheritance and subsistence, of causality and dependence, of community, 
uh, modality, possibility, impossibility, con uh, existence, non-existence, necessity, contingency. So what he's saying is these categories exist in our mind, and those are the categories we use to make sense of the world. Of the world, like Hume had told us prior, that our understanding of the world is a mental construct. Kant identifies exactly how that operates. And he says that we have categories in our mind that help us to understand and organize the world. So the mind structures experience in these necessary ways because we look at the world and say, okay, it is this way. I am making assumptions. But Kant says, well, here's how you're making assumptions. Here's, here's what's going on in your mind about how you're perceiving something. So it isn't just pure perception, right? Pure sense data. The mind is actively engaging in, in, in real time to understand what those senses are. And it does so by using these various categories that, that we have a priori, right? Beforehand in our minds. So this is where uh, Kant is different from Locke. Locke says that we have in, you know, nothing in our minds, uh, nothing is innate. What he forgot to mention was what Kant brings up, which is we may be, we, you know, a blank slate, but we still have a priori, right, beforehand categories in our minds to begin to make sense of the world. So that's how the mind structures experience in these necessary ways, because we have to, by necessity, uh, rely on these, because otherwise we're not going to be able to understand the world around us. We're not going to be able to Again, we're not going to be able to make sense of the world. And that's what Kant is describing to us, how we make sense of the world. And so Hume may have been skeptical, but Kant says that's not a bad thing, because remember, he wrote Critique of Pure Reason. It is a critique. But he says, well, let's, let's not throw everything out here, right? There are mental aspects. The, our mind interprets this world as three-dimensional because, because we cannot have it any other way. We cannot exist in a flat two-dimensional space. It's just, it's not possible. So we understand and we acknowledge and we agree, all of us, that we live in a three-dimensional world. So as a result, the world is necessarily three-dimensional. These are the categories that we hold in our minds that when we see something, we see depth. We see height, we see width. And depth especially is what we see in the real world rather than, than a movie screen or a television screen. So our minds are not only structuring experience, they're also interpreting experience and they're cataloging, categorizing every last minutia of things that are going on in our minds, again, in real time, so that we can structure that experience in a way that makes sense to us. So yes, we interpret it as causal simply because it is of necessity, because we cannot understand it any other way. So we come to an agreement that we are going to call this thing that we see but cannot measure causality. So it becomes a category. If we see this followed by that, if I look out my window and it's snowing, I'm going to assume it's probably cold. If I walk out and it's 36 degrees, something's going on. That could be volcanic ash. I better get back in the house. I don't know. But when we are looking at the world and experiencing it, yes, we have sense data, but our mind kicks in instantaneously and begins cataloging, categorizing, structuring, interpreting all this sense data, following these a priori categories that we are, we are essentially born with. We don't do it after the fact. We do it beforehand. Now, uh, the world as it really is, is something that Kant says, okay, well, we'll never We'll never know for sure the thing in itself. We, we shall never know purely and truly, but we can certainly know a lot about it, right? Because of these categories that we have in our minds. But the world as it really is, is something that we, we cannot know, right? It's a phenomenal world. These are a series of phenomenons and they are entering into our, our brain, into our mind, through our senses. And we are able to interpret the world as, as a result of it using those categories. So causality, time, space, those are modes of perception. They don't belong to the world, they belong to our minds. So the categories are always up here in our minds and since and the source of the sense data is out there. So I guess we could say in the same way that Descartes 
distinguishes and separates mind and body and says mind is spiritual, body is matter. They're utterly distinct, different substances. Kant is kind of saying the same thing about the external world, reality out there, and us uh, who are a different kind of substance. Yes, we participate in reality. We walk through because it's three-dimensional. But these kinds of claims about the world as it really is, there is ultimately a separation, right? There is a sort of sad realization that there is a separation between the world as we know it, as it really, really is, and our, our knowledge of it. And that's not to say that we will never know the world, but we will, we will have to always admit to ourselves selves that it is a phenomenal world. These are phenomena that we, we have impressed upon us through our different senses. And then we construct some version of it in our minds of what that, of what that thing is. So, for example, if you look at this little gift that's, uh, that's moving here, well, we look at it and we say, what? is this thing okay it's moving uh looks kind of three-dimensional and yet it's on a flat two-dimensional surface it's on it's on the screen of my laptop and when i look at the laptop yeah it's height and width and that's it and yet we look at this and we go it looks three-dimensional or it appears three-dimensional or i interpret and structure this thing as three-dimensional that's essentially what Kant is saying. We have built into our, into our minds these categories that allow us to make sense of the things that we see. So this is very important in terms of correcting Hume, uh, taking his sort of his skepticism, not to the point where we cannot know anything, but a healthy skepticism is certainly uh, something you find in Kant's work because again, he did write the critique of pure reason and was really reluctant to engage in pure anything, right? It always was a synthesis of empirical and rational thought. So the idea of the revolution, you could call it, with uh, Kant was that just as our minds conform to things in the world, the, the world conforms to our mind. We, we, and we can say that based on assumption, consistency, the, the impression that the world continues to give us. We know that, again, if it's snowing outside, it has to be of a certain temperature. Uh, if it isn't, there's something that clearly is, is wrong. And we know it's wrong because it's not something we we normally experience. We're experiencing something else. So what is this something else? So we go outside or we at least look through the window and our mind is going with all the different categories going, okay, it could be this, could be this. So we figure out eventually, we interpret the world eventually to figure out what's going on. But for the most part, just as our minds conform to the things in the world through our categories, the world itself conforms to the categories in our mind. So if that's the case, then Kant says, look, both fields are correct, right? Empirical sense data and idealism and its, and its use of reason, both are valid, right? Both do work. So causality is a, ne a necessary a priori aspect of the mind's interpretation. So we need to believe that causality is is a thing so in the way that hume says you know doesn't exist in the real world kant says well that's true it does it's not that it doesn't exist at all it exists in here right causality the idea the logic of causality exists not out there in the world but up here in our minds so causality becomes this uh, this very necessary a priori, it's this beforehand category, uh, in order for the mind to interpret this mind-independent reality, the world as it really is. And so if that is the case, uh, we need to be able to know that these categories are both necessary and universal, that everyone perceives these things in exactly the same way. Now, we may all perceive them the same way. There may be other people that uh, are interpreting uh, things differently. Uh, some individuals are hell bent on believing that climate change is not a real thing. Apparently, the jury's still out on that, and a vast majority of other people going, uh, "No, it's it's a thing. It's happening." And you know what? We're probably well past any kind of possible you know correction on this. We're gonna have to learn to live with you know a, a, a winter in Canada with with an inch of snow rather than five feet of snow, which is what we're typically getting. So. There, there are some things that are going on in the world that we both see and experience, 
and stru is structured in our minds, but some people interpret that information slightly differently, often for political reasons. Um, let's not get into that. But certainly when we look at the world, the world conforms to our mind because our mind conforms to the world. And so over a long period of time, our mind has come up with these construct, these categories that we have in our minds in order to make sense of the world. Now, um, if that's the case, there are some issues, uh, that, especially pertaining to not knowing the world as it really is. Uh, if we see the world as causal, it's not the same thing as the world being causal. It's simply our perception of it. But it isn't a perception that is agreed to by everyone with a pair of eyes or ears or whatever, that that causal relationship is there. We're not saying that the world is itself causal, but we perceive it as such. Our perception, our interpretation of our sense data tells us that this is, this is the way it is. So uh, the notion of the world as it really is, uh, does that close off the possibility of scientific knowledge, right? If the world is completely inaccessible, what does that mean about science? and especially pure science, theoretical physics, these kinds of things. So if the world is as it really is uh, and is inaccessible to us, then it renders science problematic. But certainly scientific knowledge is based on sense data, but it's also based on continual, uh, you know, reformulations, experimentation, consistency, uh, assumptions. And science will make a claim at a certain point that this is what we know at the present time. Well, science seems to be able to continue, right? It can, it can continue to make assumptions and hypotheses, but it also reserves the right to say, no, uh, we were wrong and we're able to move on and say, this is in fact a, a closer approximation of the world. So now we're going to wrap up with the last part of uh, Kant's, I guess, critique on Hume, or at least uh, the way in which Hume was able to sort of wake up uh, Kant to make him rethink literally everything about the world. And this is uh, Kant's uh, ideas on morality. Now, we know Hume said that uh, morality is, you know, this notion that you can't get an ought. In other words, we ought to act a certain way from an is, you know, here are the facts. Uh, for, for Hume, uh, morality was simply sentiment, right? Emotions, empathy, sentimentality, and so on. And Kant says, well, hold on, that's, that's way too shaky a, a ground for something as important as morality and ethics. He says, look, right and wrong is not a matter, you know, it's not a matter of emotion and sentiment. It's a matter of reason. It's a reasonable thing to do the right thing. There's nothing emotionally, I feel good doing this. Well, sure you do, but there needs to be something more foundational, more solid as to why someone needs to behave this way. And Kant looks at it in the following manner. He says, look, in morality, right, how we behave is a universal. In other words, we wish everyone to behave the same way, in the same way as categories are agreed to around the world that uh, of, uh, sorry, of um, uh, causality and quantity and quality and time and space and these things even if we have different time zones and you know some people measure in pounds and others in, in uh, uh, kilograms that doesn't matter the notion of weight and space and time is is very consistent you know maybe on another planet it's different we don't know uh, or if we move into the universe far enough time and space start to bend if you are into uh, you know uh, black holes and Einstein, einsteinian theory we digress. Let's get back on planet Earth here. So Kant says, look, right and wrong are a matter of reason, not emotion, because we need to look at a behavior and say it needs to be consistent. Society needs consistent behavior, universally agreed to behavior. Otherwise, society begins to break down. And so this is something that is very important uh, to Kant because he wants these, these, uh, you know, these imperatives to be categorical and to be binding. So they means uh, categorical, it is unconditioned. There's no contingency because think, compare that to emotions. Everyone has a range of emotions, a range of empathetic, you know, ideas about the world, but they're, they're too subjective. And this is what Kant is implying. They're too subjective. We need something that is objective, universal, reasonable, but it's something that everyone will agree to. And that's really the most important thing. And that's what he means by ha having it to be universal. 
So we need to ground morality in reason, right? Not in anything else. Because if you try to uh, gra ground morality in God, we have different religions that have different gods, all right? And I say gods in the plural. Um, there, there's, there's a range of subjective contingent things that Kant wishes to sort of do away with and say, look, reason is reason, no matter where you are. We have different gods, different views of nature, but reason is the same universally. Let's ground morality on that instead. And not only that, but morality doesn't exist without free will. Now, what does that mean? Free will means that we have a choice that we can make between what we ought to do, uh, because without that, morality essentially doesn't exist, because morality has to do with making the right choice, making the right, you know, choosing the right action. So we have to have both free will and the ability to choose one or the other for us to turn around and say, okay, I choose to do this. I choose not to lie. I choose not to use uh, others as means to an end. I'm using my free will. Hey, I could turn around. I could lie to people. I could get anything I want. You know, I could I could manipulate them in different ways, and I'd be a happy camper. I may not be able to sleep at night, but I'm going to be a happy camper during the day. That's what we will want to do. For Kant, there's two things. Moral morality needs to be grounded in reason, not emotions and empathy and sentiments and other subjective things. But it also needs to be grounded on free will, because without choice, morality does not exist. You have to be able to choose the wrong thing or have the wrong thing available to you in order to make the right choice. Kind of that's the way it is. So morality becomes a kind of uh, system. Uh, that's in fact what he calls it, a system of categorical imperatives. And these imperatives, uh, again, are unconditioned, the categorical and they are imperatives. You must do this. So an imperative is anything that's written with an exclamation mark, you know, like get upstairs or get out of the way. People yell at, uh, at you and, you know, do this. That's really what an imperative uh, statement is. It's an action statement. So imagine a categorical imperative is an unconditioned statement to do a certain action. So it's very consistent. And so not only that, right, it's not contingent or conditional. It's also done for its own sake. It's done for the sake of duty. It's done for the sake that it is the right thing to do. And it's also done universally for the sake of society at large. Because if we don't do that, then we end up with individuals that sort of kind of, you know, start weighing options. And eh, I could do this or that. Or maybe I'll lie today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe it depends on who I'm talking to. That's contingency. That's not what you want to do. And it's certainly not what Kant wants you to do. Be consistent be reasonable and follow through as if this were something that was being that was being done universally so um when we are talking about natural necessity right we must will this in order to continue not only existing but for society to exist for uh, countries and you know and continents and everything else for society itself to exist and that that's where the natural necessity is. We do things for certain reasons. And Kant says we need to be moral and ethical because we, we have to. If we don't, society begins to break down. And uh, not only that, but that free will is also rational. It can make a choice. But morality does not exist unless there is a choice, a good one and a bad one. And hence, you are being ethical when you choose the right one. So if there is no free will, if there is no choice, there is no morality. And if without choice, you simply are existing. You're, you're existing by necessity. You're not acting out of duty. You're simply acting in order to survive, you know, for, for another day, no matter what's going on. So Kant calls this the categorical imperative. And he sums it up this way. Act as if the maxim of your action were to become, through your will, a universal law of nature. This is also the other um, very famous you know, saying, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the categorical imperative, as simple as you can make it. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, 
allow it to be universal. In other words, assume and expect others will do the same because they will also. Now, they don't, not often, but we want to make sure that there's no conditional, you know, if this follows, you can do that. And if it's Tuesday, you don't have, you know, no, unconditioned, it's categorical, and then it's an imperative. Do it. Simply do it. So act as if the maximum of your actions were to become through your free will, that is rational, a universal law of nature. And it looks something like this. If you were to break it down, uh, break it down into four steps, you have the principle that describes your own reason for acting as, uh, as, you, as you propose. I'm going to not lie because, well, I don't want others to lie to me, so I will choose not to lie and assume others will do the same. So it's sometimes you could say, well, you know, it's in my best self-interest that I don't do that. But Kant says, no, let's go further. The, your own reasons for doing something, you know, I, I don't want to lie. Why? Because you wish it to be a universal law, the second one, a universal law governing all rational agents, all individuals who live in, in your community, in your society. So you're saying, no, I don't want to lie because it's not a good thing. Then you say, well, look, it is my duty and it's universal that I do it because I wish others to do it. And I'm going to, I will lead by example, for example, by, uh, you know, I will lead by example by doing this all the time. So the second and third uh, clause sort of run concurrently. It's a universal law governing all rational, excuse me, all agents living in society. And that principle to not lie, not murder, not cause harm, not use me, the people as a means to an end, becomes something that could be applied universally. Everyone will think this way. And then as a result, you know, ask yourself whether you would, you would will uh, to act on this principle. And of course, the answer is yes. Because if you say yes uh, to all of those, not lying, not murdering, causing harm, all these things, and you hope and wish for everyone else to, it kind of makes a pretty good society, doesn't it? You know, it's, it's a way that we can function uh, that is still very reasonable because the will is rational. It's able to, to make a decision based on its ability to choose between one or the other action and consistently always choose the right one. So Kant also says that we should act in, in such that we treat humanity never simply as a means, but always as uh, at the same time as an end. In other words, treat people with respect, that they are not a means to greater wealth or being able to watch, you know, a movie that, you know, they own on a big honking television. You know, you're not using them as a means to an end. You are respecting them as an end onto themselves, as autonomous beings, in other words. So uh, we do this ultimately. Why? Well, partly because we wish for society to continue to exist. We wish to uh, show and lead by example that this is the right way to act. And ultimately, we do this not because it is good, it is, but because it is our duty. It is our social duty to, to wear a face mask when we're outside, right? To socially distance when we're outside because we, we're in the middle of a pandemic, you know, and th those people that think that we're not... Uh, you better wake up real fast because isn't it funny that as we have more and more anti-maskers, the numbers keep going through the roof. Gee, mm, causality. Ah, is there a relationship between those two? Ah, who knows, right? That's, so, that's what I mean. So we do it not because it is good. Wearing a mask is good. I'm not a big fan of wearing a mask, but I do. But because it is my duty, I see that I do something to benefit not only myself, because it does keep me from harm, but I'm also not spreading my germs to someone else who may have a weakened immune system uh, that could be compromised in some way. They might have asthma. I don't know. Right? They, they, they could have some other underlying condition. And my stupidity, my, my refusal to wear a mask because you are offending my dignity as an autonomous being, I go and cough on that person and get them sick and they die. Now what? So we do it not only because it's good, because it is our social duty to go and act this way. So we act according to duty, not according to consequences. And consequences are very important here because um, the last couple of slides here, we're going to see the difference between uh, Kant's sort of categorical imperative or what's called the deontological uh, view of the world that we are consistently looking at right actions rather than correct actions. But really the difference is about consequences. So they do matter for sure. 
because we're talking about consequences in terms of if you are a utilitarian who is always concerned with the greater good, right, the greater social good, you're not so concerned about individuals in that society, you're more concerned with society at large. So in this case, it's, you know, the, the, the good, uh, the, the good response, the action that works at this particular time, as long as it increases the overall happiness of society, then it's okay. But what if, oh, I don't know, uh, let's say there's a, you know, there's a, a riot that's going on and people are burning buildings and they're really, really upset and it's over, it's over the fact that uh, someone's been murdered and uh, you find out, you know, that you've been brought in uh, because you're, you're there to sort of to calm people down and the police tell you that, hey, we've got, we've got someone arrested, but, but it's not the right guy. But we just want you to go out and say, hey, the police have got the right guy and, you know, people are going to stop rioting. So you go along with it. Why? Well, because even though you've lied, you've actually increased the amount of happiness. People aren't riding anymore. Yay, the police got the right guy. Okay, we can go home now. But they've got the wrong guy, right? The, you're not doing your duty. You're not lying. You're not using a, me, a person to, as a means to an end. You're simply looking at the greater, the greater happiness. So that's where an action that in under any other circumstance, lying, is not the good is not the right thing so consequences are important when it comes to morality and ethics so if you're just worried about the good then you are utilitarian because you're thinking simply of the greatest amount of good that you can generate from your actions for Kant hold on right we should be acting in accordance with the duties imposed by universal reason applicable to everyone because it is universal everywhere no matter who it is what time of the day who you're interacting with and it is the right thing to do do not lie do not cause harm do not use a person as a means to an end i don't care what the situation is you just don't do it so no matter how good the consequence of some action may be right if it violates the categorical imperative i'm just going to kind of lie this one time then we shouldn't do it and that's essentially how how kant sees it so, um, human action is morally good if it is satisfy, satisfying the categorical imperative and if it is why we are doing it. Uh, if, we, if we fear the law, well, for Kant, that's not such a bad thing because we fear being caught, right? We fear being caught harming another person or murdering someone. It's, let's say, the worst case scenario. We're doing it because it is our duty not to. That is your sole motivation. It isn't, you know, to stay out of jail. It's because it is your duty to not lie, not harm, for example. So if that is the case, a human action is morally good if it purely satisfies the categorical imperative and is the reason why we're doing it. It's our duty. This is what we want to do. So if we are doing, doing our duty um, and we're not sort of looking for some immediate reward or some further consequence uh, if we're not doing that but we're simply simply doing it because it's the right thing to do then we are acting in a moral fashion and this is what Kant is asking us to do is to act in a way that we is morally correct but also very consistent so in terms of how that fits not only in society but politically uh, Kant uh, as an enlightenment thinker was very much uh, concerned with human rights and freedoms he actually uh if you look at his essay universal peace written in 1794 five or six somewhere in there uh es essentially says that we should be able to get along as countries and he basically wrote the foundation or the blueprint of what would become the united nations after the second world war so here is kant writing in the in the twilight of the 1700s an essay called Universal Peace, and he outlines how this can be done. And he more or less describes you know, this, this uh, institution that we later would call the United Nations. And so he was very much about you know, reducing war, reducing conflict, uh, improving human rights and freedoms, in, improving scientific inquiry, opening up the avenues for, sci for science, and also, also, also very important, to use one's own reason. And that doesn't mean going on YouTube, you know, and I'm going to watch a video and one guy tells you that the earth is flat 
and because you want to feel like a rebel, you go along with it. Did you actually go do your research? Did you actually use reason? No, you got lazy and watched a video because the video tells you X or Y or whatever, whatever, you know, uh, infantile theory, uh, conspiracy theory, uh, whatever it may be. That's not using reason. That's basically sort of feeling like you, you, your voice isn't being heard. So you want to push back. And there's a whole other range of reasons why conspiracy theories are, are really popular. The main one for me is that it simplifies a complicated world, a very complicated world. No one is disagreeing on that, but it seems like conspiracy theories kind of water down that complexity. And again, try to explain the world in very simple terms. You know, people are just out to get you. No, the world is complicated. Think about it. So Kant is saying, yes, use your reason, figure it out for yourself and dare to think. And this is what he's asking us to do. So politically, this is really important because uh, every rational being, right, has an, in an innate right to freedom and a duty to enter into civil condition governed by a social contract in order to realize and preserve that freedom. So although he's not a social con uh, contract theorist, he's presenting the foundations that would allow us to enter into a contract freely because it is a moral choice that we make. We adhere and follow the, the rules and regulations and duties that come with this social contract, knowing everyone else does. And if you can do that, then society is likely to function fairly well because we're following all the same the same guides. But at the same time, you have this different perspective, this perspective of, you know, focusing on consequences rather than actions. And that's a utilitarian perspective. So we've got Kant's view of morality that is called deontology and is based on this idea of a universal morality that is also anchored upon a universal reason. Uh, and this view of being consistent because it is reasonable to be consistent is contrasted with con consequentialism or this utilitarian perspective that looks at the world in, in terms of costs and benefits. If I lie a little bit here, I will increase overall happiness. If I let this person get killed because, you know, it'll appease the mob and bring ab about happiness, I'm going to look the other way. Kant's his head would explode, right? He's, no, that's not what I'm saying. Yes, I'm saying society should continue, but not under those conditions. So uh, consequentialists, right, uh, or this utilitarian position really is saying that. And the, the main, main difference is it comes down to the correct action, the one that is correct at this moment, but could be something different next week or an hour from now, versus the right action. And right implies that the, the consequence will be the same all the time. You're doing the right thing, right? The Spike Lee movie, do the right thing. That's, that's what Kant is saying. Do the right thing because it is reasonable. It is rational. It is your free will, uh, acting upon this moral duty that you have. Uh, and it is something you wish to show by example to others that if they too do the same thing, society will be functioning on a much on a much higher level and a much more enlightened level so that's basically david hume and emmanuel kant uh we'll talk about this in monday's class i just wanted to get this posted right away so hopefully if uh if it's clear great if you have any questions please bring them uh with you on monday afternoon when we talk or you can send me an email in the meantime uh between now and monday take care and we will talk to you soon